We are playing Mendermania 1962. Now, I'm going to play the opening that I have been playing against 1d4, which is the King's Indian Defense. Those of you just joining, Dasku, thank you for the prime. I will explain, once again, the main sort of ideas of this opening. If you've never played the King's Indian, it can look terrible. What am I doing? I'm giving him full control of the center. And that's the point of the King's Indian. What you do is you give your opponent control of the center with the ultimate aim of attacking that center with your pieces from a distance. It's called a hypermodern opening. So here's the thing. I'm going to go e5 and here we have it, right? Attacking his center with my pawns. This is the main move. It does not blunder a pawn. Uh, and I'll explain everything after the game. What's up, String? Good to see you. And we're going to open up the center so that we can more easily attack the e4 pawn with our pieces. How should I attack the e4 pawn? Can somebody tell me the simple way? Bingo. Rookie 8. He's going to have three. What has this move done immediately? Remember what I told you last game. Whenever the F-pawn is pushed, you need to understand the drawbacks of every move that your opponent plays. Now, this is just a general weakening move, but it, look at this bishop on e3. This bishop is undefended. What does that mean? That means that if we can get this pawn out of e4, that's going to be something, a sticky situation. Now, we can't go d5 immediately, right? Uh, because he takes with this pawn. But can we prepare the move d5? Can we prepare... The pawn break d5, hoping to exploit his bishop. This is theory, by the way. He's He hasn't done anything wrong. This is the main line. But if white doesn't know exactly how to play here, he can get in very big trouble. He plays it correctly with queen d2. We've got d5 anyway, because even though the bishop is defended, uh, it's still very flimsy. All right, this goes back to the concept of, okay, so e5 just gives up a pawn. That's definitely not the best way to play it. And uh, we've gotten everything. We've opened up the e-file, which we wanted, and we've won a pawn. Okay, so now let's continue our development by playing knight to c6. If he takes my knight, we take with a pawn, and then we are able to support the pawn on d5. Queen e8 was possible, but then he could have just dropped his bishop back, right? We don't want to, like, put all of our aces on the table at once. So, okay, what should we do? Who can... This is an interesting situation. There's many ways to play it. But um, I want you guys to sort of be be engaged here in the, in the development. Now, rook takes c3 is is interesting but it doesn't work and i will i will show this after the game so in if we were to follow the rules by the book we would say okay the bishop is not developed we need to develop the bishop where should we develop it i don't like bishop f5 because it allows knight takes f5 so we're just going to go bishop d7 remember what i always say not every one of your pieces needs to be working on you know the covid vaccine distribution you could have a piece that's just sort of chilling you know, on a beach somewhere, and that's the bishop, okay? The point of playing bishop d7 is to just develop it, connect the rooks, uh, and 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 you're fine. Okay, so what should we do now? Well, I'm looking at the knight, and that's setting the metal detector off in my head. Whoa, 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 wait a second. Knight's defended by the queen, but there's a bishop here. I can take on d4. I can get his queen onto a very vulnerable square. Why is it vulnerable? Because it's x-rayed by the bishop. This is called an x-ray. And the x-ray is a precursor to a discovered attack or a discovered check where you move, you basically you tear the cover off and then that bishop's going to attack the queen. But we want to get the most bang for our buck. And as you guys are indicating, knight h5 is the way to do it. Making contact with the bishop. And now comes the winning idea. Once he takes, what should black now do? Look at the position carefully. How has it transformed? What can we do to win the game? That's why I love the King's Indian. You know, white, white makes one move incorrectly, and he loses the game. We chop off the defender of the bishop on e2. Type 1 and type 2 undefended pieces come into play. I will recap that concept for you after the game. And we are going to be up a full piece. Okay. So I'm just making some notes about what I want to talk about. It's very hard for me to sort of, set in an in adequate manner, introduce the King's Indian because it's such a complex opening. Let's unpin ourselves. Uh, but I'll do my best, and I've already talked about it on some occasions. Okay, so uh, he wants to go h5, some shenanigans. Uh, let's let's cut that, let's nip that in the bud. Uh, not necessary, but still. Now he's created a weakness on h4. Queen is tied down to the pawn. Okay, let's not forget that he threatens 
uh, rook takes d7. Where should our bishop go? What would be a nice active solid square for the bishop? Not bishop b5, because that would blunder it, but bishop to c6, right? Why is this a good square? Because it's defended by a pawn. That's the only way to make sure your piece is really safe is when it's defended by a pawn. I will delve into that after the game. And once again, a huge shout out. Still, we have 6,000 viewers. Amazing stuff. Thank you guys so very much for all the support, all the hype. And, and the engagement, everybody's engaged and, and I'm, I love to see that. So now we have this rook on a, it feels sad, sad. It's left out. Um, let's make sure it's not left out by, by creating the Alakine gun. Alakine's gun is essentially when you triple your pieces, I think technically it means like queen behind the rooks, but informally it refers to any kind of tripling along a file named after Alexander Alakine, uh, early world champion. Um, fourth, fourth world champion from Russia. And now, if we remember something about his move h4, right, it created a weakness. We always need to sort of like a librarian, we need to catalog all of our opponent's weaknesses. What should we do? Check. Now let me, all right, guys, I'm going to rub it in a little bit. We can, okay, he, he resigned. I was going to rub it in. We could have gone rookie one with a checkmate or queen f2. But we had a pretty checkmate by sacrificing the rook. We could have sacked the rook to open his king up further. And guess what? Rookie two is a simple mate. But if we wanted to rub it in even further, who can tell me a very pretty follow-up that we could uh, put on the board here? Further ripping open his king position. Queen g4 is possible, yeah. But also bishop f3. Sacrificing the bishop. Check. Rook cuts off the king. King has to go back. And now the ladder mate, rookie two. Queen g2. Okay, so there was an abundance of mates here and he graciously resigned. All right. So King's Indian, first played in the in the year 1850, did not become popular until the 1920s, 1930s, and still rarely played until the 60s and 70s. Why? Because if you think about chess history, I've explained this before. When chess was first starting to be a thing, uh, people followed the rules, right? People follow the rules, and the rules said that you had to control the center. And in the King's Indian, Black most certainly does not control the center with his pawns. He controls it with his pieces. That's why the King's Indian is called a hyper-modern opening, because in the 1920s, there was a group of uh, pretty interesting people. They were from all parts of Europe, and they were called the hyper-modernists. Hyper-modernists says, hey, guys, let's, let's all chill out. Let's, uh, you know sip on some wine and the people from California said, let's, you know, let's, uh, you know, do something other than sipping on wine. Uh, let's all chill out for a second. Let's understand something. You don't always have to control the center with pawns in order for your development to be effective. What they said is that let's let our opponents control the center with his pawns and then let's shoot these pawns down from a distance. That's why they deploy the bishop here. Um, and, and that's why black sort of holds back white center without actually immediately contesting it. And only black puts pressure on that center when he is ready to do so. That's sort of the philosophy of the King's Indian. And the movie five comes, right? Immediately striking the pawn on d4. I've played the King's Indian my whole life. Um, now, why doesn't this blunder a pawn? Why, why can't white just take the pawn? There's a small tactic here. Uh, and without this tactic, the King's Indian would simply fail. Yeah, knight takes c4, exposing the attack on the knight, equalizing the material, and white's going to have, or black's going to have a massive bishop here on e5. All right. Now, commonly in the king's Indian, white pushes d5. This creates a locked center. And then white castles king's side. This is what makes the king's Indian fascinating. It's an attack on either side of the board. White attacks on the queen's side, black attacks on the king's side. Black goes for checkmate. So it's a very ambitious opening. It's an opening for aggressive players. It's a very hard opening to learn. Instead, he decided to keep the center open. I opened it up, and uh, queen d2 was played. Now, using chess base, which I've, uh, as I told you guys, I have used it to show you these, these, these games, uh, I am going to check for a second to see whether this has ever actually happened in tournament play. And one thing that you can check using chess base, which has the largest... Uh, database of official tournament games ever assembled, millions and millions of them. I can check this position to see who's played like this before. So 
queen to d2 100 okay over four, over 500 games uh and gary kasparov had a game here with the black pieces d5 is the main move and um c takes d5 is rare only 22 games and then the move e5 was only played once in 2004. rook takes e5 so this position only occurred once in recorded tournament play in 2004. Uh, and of course, I'm just much better because I'm up, a, I'm up a, a pawn, and I develop my knight. In that game, Black played Rook takes c3, which I completely don't get. I think it's premature to do this, even though Black actually won the game. Icelandic player Bjornsson. Uh, I think he went like this, maybe trying to pin. Anyways, development Bishop to d7. Um, now type one and type two undefended pieces very quickly. Um, there's three types. Pieces can be categorized, broadly speaking, into three departments. Number one, undefended type one. I, and I formulated this myself. It's a little clunky, but mark my words, I think it's helpful. Type one undefended piece is a piece that is literally unprotected by any other pieces or pawns. Does either side have any type one undefended pieces? And the king we exclude from this category, and the queen is in a special category. I'll explain that um, in, in a moment. No, he does not, right? Then type two undefended piece. And a type two undefended piece is a piece that is only defended by one other piece, not a pawn, not a game, not a game, practice, one other piece. Which type two undefended piece jumps to mind using that definition? Who can tell me? The key, of course, the bishop. Now, the third category is a defended piece. And in my definition, black technically has a type two on, on G7, right? I sound like a dentist. Now, is the G7 bishop vulnerable? No, because white has no pieces there, okay? So this is all only important if it's relevant. Now, a defended piece is a piece that is protected by a pawn or by more than one piece, okay? This knight is defended, this bishop is defended, okay? Now, again, this is just something I created to, to facilitate making the right observations. Now, here's the thing. When this position is reached, how does my how does my brain process the position that's on the board? Well, there's a couple of things I notice. The first is you guys all see this, right? The x-ray. But then, and this is the key, bishop on e2. What kind of a bishop is it using our categorization? Is it defended? It's a type Addicting air, thank you for the prime. It's a type two. How about the bishop on a4? What can you tell me about this bishop? It's a type two. Now the queen, I told you I'd talk about that later. The queen is always undefended, no matter how many pawns or pieces are in contact with it. The reason the queen is always undefended is because when the queen is attacked by any piece other than another queen, it must move. Does that make sense? So you could have 50 pieces quote unquote defending it, but it's still gonna have to move because it's the most valuable piece. So there's three undefended pieces in sort of the same zip code. That's why I see knight h5 and this bishop type two undefended. Only the knight is defending it. We chop the legs off and we win the bishop. That's sort of the logic. Hopefully that makes sense. And the rest is very straightforward. Okay, um, that's, <laughs> I don't know about that, Luke, but you can go pretty far, I think. Uh, does queen b4 for him there defend? I don't think it does. I think he's pretty much busted. Uh, queen b4 is the same exact thing. We take the knight. Sorry, we take the bishop. Or we could have also taken the knight first and then take the knight. Um, so honestly, I think this is an underestimated way of thinking about certain positions. You can do a lot by simply constantly harping on the type 1 and type 2 undefended pieces in a position. And if you guys just give me one moment, please. Let me see if I can find a very quick illustrative game from my own chess career. Like, can you actually, you know, pra do you actually practice what you preach, Daniel? You might be asking, and I try to when possible. Uh, let me see if I can, oh, let me see if I can find a game from early in my chess career where I did something like that. Ah, yes, I, I can actually. I remember a nice little combination I had which sort of exploits this concept. 2005, um, November 5th, four days before my 10th birthday. This position appears on the board. I'm playing a 1400. Yes, I was 1800 once. Bishop takes f3. So it looks like 
everything is fine for white, right? I mean, material is equal. We can trade bishops, but what does that really do, right? But here's the thing. What can you guys tell me about this bishop? What kind of a piece is it? It's a type two undefended piece. Only the rook is defending, which means it's incredibly vulnerable to tactics. And the move is rook to d1. Distracting the rook from f1, it's got to take. My opponent resigned because now I pick up the bishop and simultaneously fork the rook. So there's another tactical idea that's involved here. But you spot this by initially understanding that the bishop on f3 is incredibly vulnerable, as is the rook on f1. This is the type 1 undefended piece. So both are exploited here. If only white's king was, let's say, on g2, none of this would have worked. That's how important this difference is to make. Why does bishop d3 not work for white in a Sicilian? Oh, so any questions, by the way, about this game? So type 1 is a piece that's not defended by any pieces. Type 2 is a piece that is defended by only one other piece and not a pawn. Uh, Mycon asks, when you move bishop c6, why couldn't you activate the rook by going rook to d8? A fantastic question. So, and I'm actually sorry, I'm not sure where. Oh, because uh, the, the reason is because uh, this would have self-pinned me, right? And now I can't move the bishop away uh, because the rook on d8 is going to be hanging. you got to be careful about that. He could even put pressure on the bishop, and I might even lose this bishop. Black has ways to get out of this, but that's basically the reason, right? Why did knight e4 not work in that position? Another great question. Thank you for uh, being brave. Knight e4 did work, kind of, but he could have dropped his queen back to d3. And the problem is, even though the bishop on e2 is a type 2 undefended piece, there's no other undefended piece to exploit. The two bishops are not forkable. What's wrong with e5 instead of knight f6? Well, the move e5 here is the Englun gambit. That's not a great opening, but it's possible. Why are pieces covered by a pawn automatically defend it and another fantastic question that's the the last question that we'll move on um so here's the logic right here is the logic um and once again let's take a skeleton position on chess space good enough okay so essentially yes there are no kings on the board i'm just trying to illustrate a concept here okay so basically oh, now my ocd is coming in i gotta gotta make sure the board is perfect now I gotta make sure my webcam is flush with the board because I can't look at this. <laughs> yeah, it's gotta be perfect. Even though this is gonna take me about two seconds to show. There we go. You guys, you guys know what I mean, right? I mean, ah, perfect. Okay. Um, here's the thing. Um, you see that the bishops are in a standoff, right? Bishops are in a stand-up. Now, let's consider two distinct situations. Number one, let's move black's pawn out to b7, okay? Does black's bishop, and let's, let's say that white's pawn is on g2, does either bishop have to move? Like, is either bishop actually threatened here? Yes or no? No. Because the pawns are defending each pawn their respective bishop. Now let's consider a different scenario. Let's consider a scenario where instead of that pawn on b7, black had a knight on d8 guarding the bishop. Panda, panic, thank you for, panic, thank you for the prime. What can white now try to do in order to remove the defender? Can you guys give me both moves that accomplish this task? Bishop b6 is one of them. Bishop g5 is the other. Exactly. And the other ones are... Just kidding. <laughs> I can. This is a, a cool feature in the new chess space. I can make illegal moves. And I can even take my own pieces. Uh, but anyways, uh, that's sort of the bottom line. Now, if we compare these two situations, right, do you guys see how much harder it is to undermine a pawn than to attack a piece? That's the bottom line. You can't undermine this pawn. If you had a pawn on a5, you could have done this potentially but this is very hard to orchestrate that is why uh that is why i think that you know pawns protecting a piece are the safest form of defense so that's why we call them defenders okay so let's play something different okay let's play a modern uh modern is the move gc that's like a king's indian against e4 uh it's an opening that i have played for many years 
Now this is different than a King's Indian. In the King's Indian, white goes c4. So white can transpose the game into the King's Indian, but you, you should be careful about assuming that this is the same thing. This opening is quite a bit more dubious than the King's Indian, uh, but it's still a very reputable opening. You know, it's not, it's not been refuted. Once again, if you guys are paying attention to my explanation of hyper-modern openings, this is a literally called the modern, because look at what we're allowing white to do. We're allowing white to build massive control of the center. What we're going to do in return after developing our pieces is attack that center from a distance. Thank you, Cloud9 point. So now we're going to castle. We're going to develop. And uh, white has several ways. Yep, so he plays the annoying move. We're going to take the pawn. And our fundamental strategy here is going to be to somehow find a way to undermine this pawn chain. But first, our knight is hanging. Where should we put this knight so that it remains active? Knight d7, yes. Knight d7 is a little bit passive, although that might be the theoretical move. But knight h5, knights on the rim are grim. Knight e8 is passive. Knight g4 allows him to chase that knight to the rim with h3. Knight d5 is the move. Don't disqualify a move just because it leads to a trade. Trades can be good. In fact, this one is. He goes bishop c4. That's a good move. And now a very instructive moment. Should we or should we not take on c3? What do you guys say? Well, I'm going to tell you this. We shouldn't. We shouldn't because even though he uh, has doubled pawns, and I'll explain this in greater depth after the game, what happens as a consequence is that the pawn on c3 lends support to the pawn on d4. That creates a pawn chain. So we're basically helping him uh, buttress the pawn. So instead, we're going to go bishop to e6, developing the bishop and defending the knight. We're going to keep the blockade on d5 going strong. Okay, so knight takes c3 is only a move that we're going to make if we get desperate, if we have to take on c3. But remember, people sometimes get obsessed with doubled pawns. The way to think about doubled pawns, they can be actually good. He just made a big mistake. What did he just allow? He miscalculated. He's going to lose two pawns in the end. We'll look at the bishop. Type 1 undefended. Type 1 undefended piece. There's a standoff. Boom, goes the dynamite. That's a discovered attack. Now, he saw this. He saw this. Knight takes e6. That's his idea. And the thing is, if we take his knight, that's out of the question. He takes ours. But, of course, we take the queen. He takes our queen. We take his knight. What he didn't see was that d4 is now hanging. We have succeeded in our strategy. We have literally we have won both of his central pawns. That's the ideal scenario. We are going to be up two pawns in the endgame. Okay, so he tries to trick us here. Um, that's actually not a bad move at all. That's quite an interesting move, I should say. Let me calculate for a second, guys. Let me actually think before I make any recommendations. Because there's several things that we can consider doing here. Just need to think for a second. Okay, we're fine. So what should we do? What we should do is, number one, we should ask ourselves, can we defend the knight? Can we defend the knight? We can. Rook takes d4. Now, the reason I was hesitant here, I'm not trying to flex on anybody, I was genuinely trying to calculate this out, is because of this nasty little check, right? Our king is a little bit in trouble here. Even without the queens, I had to make sure that there were no shenanigans in relation to the in relation to the, to the king. So he goes c3 to chase away the rook. Oh, but he found a really nice idea, which I actually missed. He's going to go bishop b3. That is actually brilliant by him. He's opening up a little window to the knight. He's going to win back the knight. That's not a problem, though. The reason... Oh, he doesn't do it. He, he should have done it. He would have still been in very big trouble had that happened. What does he allow us to now to do? And this I calculated. This I saw. Th this is what I had actually expected. We can take b2. That knight is a very slippery piece. He does take e7, but it's not a problem. We move our rook to c8. I know it looks scary, but remember, we are up a piece... The queens are off the board, and look at this trooper here on g7. It's covering everything up. It's making everything safe, and he's going to run out of gas. It's just crucial that we develop very fast, right? We don't want to dilly-dally any longer. We want to make sure that we get our pieces out super, super fast, and I really mean it. In fact, what move can we now make? Do not automatically assume that you have to move the knight. What can we do? Knight d3 is possible, but in the interest of rapid development, we can simply go knight to c6, undefended pieces. Type 1, knight c6, 
trades are in our favor. We've linked up the rooks. We can take a deep breath. We're chilling, we're living, we're grooving. And now we can remove, remove our knight from b2 and go after the c5 pawn. He can push that pawn to e6, but that's why we deployed our knight to c6. It's not going any further than that. Okay, well, he's taken b7, which is possible, but now we can chop the legs off of that pawn. And all we need to do now is be a little bit careful because he's got some pinning ideas and some action here. What should we do to, you know, reduce some of the, you know, turn the, vol the volume dial down a little bit on the heat? We should go rook b8 and chase after this rook. Now, the knight, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I didn't mean to preempt that. The knights defend each other, which is an ideal scenario. But we also need to be careful. If he had a pawn on f2, right? If he had a pawn on f2, he would have gone f4. And then we would have been uh, in trouble. So let's take with the rook. Here we can just keep the knights like this because they're unassailable. He's not actually threatening anything, right? Does that make sense to you guys? He's not actually threatening to take either one of the knights because they're completely self-sufficient. So we can infiltrate to the second rank and he resigns. Great game. Okay. So what happened? The modern, g6, Fian Kettoing the bishop. Now, the first time that the modern was actually played, and again, I love to give you guys these multiple choice questions, uh, historical. Now, in recorded history, do you guys think that the modern was played in for the first time in, I'm going to give you a multiple choice, 1700? 1800, approximately. 1850? 1900 or 1950 1700 increments of 50 17 1750 18 1850 19 1950 it's called the modern okay a lot of you guys are hitting it right on the money i'm seeing the right answer more often than not the modern was first played by a guy named pierre charles saint he was one of the strongest players of the 19th century was first played in London in 1842 by saint Man against John Cochran. And he didn't play it quite in the way that we do now. It was then played in 1852, 1880, and by the early 1900s, by the, by the second half of the 20th century, it had become very commonplace. So you could have counted on one hand the amount of times basically that it was played before 1950. Those were some brave souls. So saint Man, Capablanca played it. A lot of interesting people played it. I've played it many times myself. Now, he played what's called the Austrian attack. Why is it called the Austrian attack? I don't actually know. Um, I guess maybe it was first played in Austria. Let's do some investigating. This, this move f4 was first played in 1951 in Switzerland. So not quite in Austria. It was first played in, the, in, in Switzerland by a very good player, Joseph Kupper. And I think he might have been Austrian. No, he was Swiss. I don't know. Maybe that's um, the Austrian Swiss attack is what it should have maybe been called. But uh, openings are not always named after the first person who played them. This will be on the test. Anyways, e5 pushing his pawn. We take it. Blockade on d5. I hope it made sense, my explanation, why we didn't put the knight anywhere else. And now, why not knight takes c3? People consistently underestimate, sorry, overestimate how good it is to have your opponents have doubled pawns. In fact, I tell this story often. Uh, when I was growing up in the San Francisco uh, Mechanics Institute chess club, uh, there was a guy named Arthur who was about 1,700. He was a good club player. Arthur had a literal phobia of doubled pawns. He would, he would take, you know, the most insane measures to avoid having a pair of doubled pawns. Well, doubled pawns can be good. Look at this. You open up the B file for him. Good point. You allow him to have a pawn chain. And, okay, the pawns are ugly. You're not going to invite these pawns to prom. But that's fine, right? Because they do other, other stuff. Okay. Bishop e6. What should he have done to make sure that this standoff is not going to just kill him here? This is a very typical move. And if you guys are paying attention to my demonstration of defended and undefended pieces on chess base, you can connect the dots here. Bishop b3 is exactly right. Now, queen e2 is fine, but then the bishop is only a type 2. Bishop b3, and look at how secure this bishop is. You're never going to have to worry about losing it. That's what white should have done. Knight g5, knight takes c3. 
Now, if he takes on d1, and that's probably what he missed, boom, boom, and we're up two pawns in the endgame. Yeah, so e6 and c6 are both possible. e6 creates some weaknesses. So between those two moves, I actually think c6 might be the main move. Okay, why not bishop takes knight there? Where? I'm not sure where you mean. Where, where, where are you referring to? Anyways, he goes castles. Uh, pawn to b3 would be fine, uh, except it would it would but it, but but you would hang the knight right. You would create another undefended piece. Make sure that when you're trying to solve a problem in chess, make sure that you're not creating another one in its place. Very typical cause of blunders. If you're troubleshooting, you're like, okay, there's one thing I need to solve here. Make sure that you're not tunnel visioning, right? A, words that are in Charlie's nightmares. Tunnel visioning is when you zero in too much on one particular concept, forgetting about others. Um, so, castles, rook takes d4, bishop f7, king should now here, he should have gone bishop b3. And you guys can see that this knight is trapped. Now, when your piece is trapped, you shouldn't panic. What you should try to do is figure out whether you can give that piece up for the maximum amount of material. So, what does that mean? There's two possible moves. Knight c3, knight b2. Now, knight b2 helps him develop. We don't want to help our opponent develop. So knight takes c3 is the move. Bishop takes c5. Birch, thank you for the sub, PhD. You see, always logical. So here it looks scary, but there's nothing. If he goes bishop e6, by the way, it looks like the rook is trapped. But now we have this square and we skewer the bishops. So here, knight c6, not, nothing automatic, no knee-jerk reactions. Developing the knight. And now the smoke clears. We trade the rooks. We infiltrate to the second rank and we win the game. Why not rook d7 instead of rook c8? Um, why not rook d7 instead of rook c8? Oh, yeah, rook d7 was possible, but I was a little bit concerned about leaving that back rank unattended, although I don't think he actually has anything. This would have been possible. So something like this was what concerned me. And then he can play the move e6 with tempo. Also, I thought maybe I'd leave the d7 square available for that. Why did he resign? Because he's down a piece in an endgame, which is quite an overwhelming advantage at this level. 